gave it like five. So it's now recording. Four, four minutes or so. How are the roads for for everybody? Not bad. Not bad. Wet, but not really slippery. Yeah, I don't think anything really stuck. Okay. Yeah, it seems like it. Around three, we 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 were here while watching it snow yesterday, and we're like, oh my God, the roads are going to be terrible. We've we've all got to get out now. And then you know, I get up to Denver. I'm like, there's nothing yeah. here. The roads are fine. Yeah, it's coming from North Denver, and the snow had already stopped. Started yeah. on there about halfway down. Okay. Yeah. It was it was a little worse down 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 here than up north, but yeah, it's gonna be all right. Cream or yes, that's cream. Yeah, and then you find a sugar packet that, like, half and half? Uh, Starbucks just said this is creamer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming half and half, though. That's usually what they have, I think, out mm -hmm. in there. I, 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 I do have all, almond milk as well in case that's eventually going to be warm. changing thing that at any moment, you know, you could wake up 
having bitten your tongue or you know anything else, but don't stress about it. Uh, you know, and, and we're never going to recommend you see someone to get help with that. So, as I was writing my portion of the training, I was really just processing everything I I learned to do by myself, uh, which is one of the reasons I got into counseling was because this was such a life changing event that I had to carry on my own. It felt like at times that I wanted to turn around and help other people, but for a long time, I didn't know anybody else with epilepsy. And when I say a long time, I mean like five years ago is when I started getting involved with EFCO, and it was the first time I sat around a table talking to other people with epilepsy because, at least for me, it's just something that you don't talk about. Uh, you don't want other people putting that light on you or seeing you through that lens. So uh, it, it took quite a while for me, even as a clinician, to feel comfortable opening up to other people about it. That, that's why this is so crucial, and that's why we're so excited to have you here, because I'm certain there are a lot more like me out there that want to talk to someone, just either don't know how or don't have the courage to do it. Uh, so that's what we're going to try and address. Yeah, yeah and um, Mark has been a wonderful volunteer for us, obviously has epilepsy, so is one of those voices of and a unique voice because you are a therapist and so um, kind of pivotal bringing this whole thing to fruition. So thank you for your time and energy. Um, okay, so um, today, well, and let's, I mean, I want to make this more of a conversation than just like me preaching to you guys <laughs> or Mark preaching to you guys. So, but just so you know what to expect. Oh, and before I get started, bathrooms are out the door. <laughs> um, go out our door, and um, basically when you're at the elevator area, men's are on one side, women's are on the other. So, um, and what else? Is there anything else we could quickly? Are we going to take a break or something like that? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, we'll That's take good. a break. Um, Come on in. Yeah, at we, least we, between we our portions, started. so within like an hour. Forty five minutes to an hour. Um and then feel free to get up and uh, yeah, use the bathroom if you want. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't the class where we're great teachers. So yeah. Um we're all adults. <laughs> um and uh before also any of us forget, although we might mention it, that book that is on the some things that Mark said um kind of struck me to say there's a book on the table. Um the author is Kirk Eichenwald. He actually was here for um, a signing recently, but he he is a New York Times editor. Yeah, and he 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 wrote The Informant, which was a movie that starred Matt Damon a couple years ago. So he's a really great author, really, really well, really well respected. And the book is phenomenal. Yeah, it's it's intense, but phenomenal. Yeah, it, it, yeah. he has epilepsy. Well. Unraveled. A mind unraveled, and you can get it audio too, right? That he yeah, does. Yeah, that, and he actually reads it uh, and has recordings that his uh, fr from over the years. He did a great job of documenting like what his roommates would tell him happened during the seizures mm -hmm. and everything. So uh, I imagine the book is great. I listened to the Audible one. Uh, so that's another. One. <laughs> yeah, and um, so today we will um, educate you on seizure disorders and what to do if somebody has a seizure. Um, we'll talk about common mental health issues. Um, CBT and mindfulness techniques to reduce seizure activity, um, resources that are available to clients and their families, and then also the preferred um, provider network logistics will be talked about too. So um, that's kind of the overview, and when I do trainings, I really like to talk about how it affects the whole person, um, not just like, oh, they're having a seizure and this is what you do in that moment, because it is, as Mark kind of explained, it really affects every part aspect of their life. So um, what uh, have any of you actually seen seizures or yeah, you do any of you have like a personal connect to epilepsy at all? Okay. Okay. My one of my sisters. Okay. She had epileptic seizures, so I guess that's why I feel like I've been counseling all my life because I was 7 years younger and so to just be there in that, you know, that presence for her, they were petite. Yeah. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. just watching that and get, having her, I remember her descriptions very well yeah. of what the sense that would come on first before she started the incoherent mumbling and yeah. we would just kind of gather as a comforting presence and be there for her. So Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that too. And um, anything that you have to add from your own personal experience throughout this, please add it. And that goes for anybody who has anything to add. But yeah. and I was in HR for many years, so one of my employees had grand mal seizures. Oh, yeah. so we kind of had a little team that we would swarm in to just form a protective barrier of, you know, at least trying to make sure he wasn't going to hit his head on something. Or, um, you know, if they're starting to bite their tongue, I mean, I'm not, I don't remember exactly, you know, I know you're not supposed to get in there because right. they could bite you too, which, right. you know, may okay, but you want to help them. Right. So I'm looking forward to some yes. guidance again, a refresher that's been several years ago. So. Yes, yes, and you would be surprised at how many professionals, like even school nurses, are not given training on epilepsy. Yes. Um, first responders <coughs> are not given training on epilepsy. So these are all trainings that we do. Um, and we can provide, that goes for if you, you're seeing clients or anything, um, we can go talk to their employers, we can kind of work as mediators sort of sometimes, so um, just keep that in mind because um, in my 12 years, I have, I really believe it's ignorance is at the core of the discrimination and usually when we go in and kind of explain a little or validate that really, no, seizures can look like that and uh, your medicines do affect people like that, then um, suddenly the professionals change um, their approach with, with kids, with adults, with everything. So um, so what a seizure is, is a um, brief disruption of, uh, or excess, I guess, of um, electrical activity in the brain. And it can affect these four things or one of them. So movement, sensation, behavior, or awareness. So we'll talk about different seizures. You talked about petite mal, which they don't use that term anymore, but um, but that's a different kind that affects different, you know, not necessarily the full-blown thing. So um, what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is when it's chronic, so it's a chronic neurological disorder. Um, usually they have had three or more seizures in their lifetime to be diagnosed. Um, and then also we talked about this, that many people will use the term seizure disorder. Um, and a lot of people actually will be like, no, I don't have epilepsy, I have a seizure disorder, I have seizures. Um, they're one in the same, so <coughs> if they've had three or more in their lifetime, not just a seizure, they have epilepsy. Epilepsy um, sort of has more stigma to it for some reason than saying I have seizures. Um, so a lot of people will not want to use that term. Some doctors, you gave an example of like doctors sometimes won't even use the term epilepsy with someone, so they may not even realize that that's what they have. Or they might even discourage someone from using that term as well. Hey, when you're talking to other people like at work about it, don't say epilepsy. Yeah. It's a seizure disorder or I have a seizure. So very stigmatizing. Yeah, and I often see it with kids, um, for those of you who work with kids, um, they're, uh, they're, um, oh my gosh, I just had a brief. Um, oh, if they have uh, another disorder, so like autism, oftentimes epilepsy goes with uh, it's like a comorbidity with autism or cerebral palsy or any of those. And if they have seizures with it, the parents will not use the term epilepsy and won't, won't even really want to identify with um, our organization or, or any sort of epilepsy, anything. So. Um, maybe that's changing, I don't know, but I, that's what I have seen throughout my time, too. So, um, so key facts, so 3.4 million Americans are living with epilepsy right now. Um, that's basically one in 100. Um, one in 26, though, will be diagnosed in their lifetime. So the discrepancy of those numbers is that um, people can outgrow seizures or oftentimes, actually, children and seniors are the most... Um, common time to be diagnosed with epilepsy, so, um, you know, you could live without it for your entire life and get it when you're 60 years old, or you could get it when you're 20 or 30 or at any age, so um, that, that is the difference in those numbers. Uh, one in 10 will have a single seizure in their lifetime. That doesn't predict anything about having epilepsy. Um, that's usually caused by a high fever or some outstanding circumstance, but that's pretty common. Um, and it's more common than cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, and MS, if you were going to combine all of those. Um, generally, seizures are not a medical emergency. 
see. So if you're seeing a client with epilepsy in your office and they have a seizure, it's not a medical emergency. Um, and then also people may not be aware of when they're having a seizure. So the, the abstinence seizures is what we call kind of the spacing out seizures if they're having a lot of those um, or even if they have one. They are not accurate reporters. So to be like, did you just have a seizure? Or you know, are you having a lot of seizures at work? Or they're not going to be accurate what, reporters. What did you call the space out? Absence. Absence. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we'll talk more specifically. And if we have time, we'll show a video, and you can kind of see examples of what that looks like. I think that's really helpful. If we don't have time, we'll send you guys a link to the video, and you can watch it on your own. Um, because it is very hard to catch, and a lot of people will, I mean, a lot of people that we work with have many, many, many of these in a day, so like 100 plus sometimes. And at that point, it's really disrupting their, their work, their um, school, their learning, their social life, everything. So, um, so anyway, um, most people do not die from seizures. There is a thing called SUDEP. I would just want to say, um, so I'm not explaining death in epilepsy. There's a slide on it. We'll get to that. But most people with a typical seizure that's going to run its typical course will not die from a seizure. So, um, And then um, people cannot swallow their tongue. So that goes to don't stick anything in their mouth. They might bite their tongue. And they might have blood um, coming out of their mouth. Obviously, that's unpleasant. But it, you know they're not going to swallow their tongue like they used to say. Um, so we were talking about this prior to this training, too, about how most people with epilepsy are not given a reason why they have it um, or cause of it. So uh, that's about 70%. And to keep that in mind when you're having clients with epilepsy, that that is part of their whole frustration, um, stress, I mean, everything, right, increases because you don't have answers, so you can't cure it then, you know? Um, 30%, it's usually due to something like it could be connected to TBI, um, genetics even. You know, there can be underlying causes that, that they can identify. And actually, there, there are some DNA tests now that will link more severe types of epilepsy with the DNA. Um, so there's certain types of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gestalt syndrome. Those now are connected with DNA. Um, so those are helpful, but those are like pretty rare, like unique circumstances too. So what are they called? Um, Drave is one of them, and Lennox Gestalt syndrome is another. There's also um, oh, what's the other one? Do you know the third one? Um, Duke syndrome is another. One more time. Duke. D o o s. -E. Yeah, um, and Dravet actually has its own uh, foundation. So if they are, if they do have Dravet, um, they might be connected with us. They might just be connected with the Dravet syndrome or the Dravet foundation. Um, and their Dravet actually drives a ton of research. That's their like main mission. And so we benefit, just general epilepsy benefits from a lot of the research that they do for Dravet. Um, just as like a trickle down sort of thing. Um, so anyway, but Dravet can be very, very like life altering. I'll, I'll, a lot of them will die younger, although a lot are living longer now. So you might see adults transitioning for medical care. It's all kind of new. It's a new frontier really because um, they have never really lived that long to be able to be an adult and transition before. So. Um, so more treatments, you know, are out there, but also more needed. Um, <clears throat> all right, so seizure types. Um, if you think about them as being under these two kind of general umbrellas, you either have a generalized seizure or you have a focal seizure. So um, most diagnoses will come with that in the title. Um, if you see, like, the medical paperwork. <laughs> Um, generalized seizure just means that the electrical activity is happening in the entire brain at one time, and focal seizure means it's like in a focalized, in a, you know, in a spot. And the focal seizure could lead to a generalized seizure. So a lot of people will have um, that happen where it starts in one area but spreads. Um, there are treatments.
treatments we'll get to at the end for those people who have the focal seizure that may not work for people who have the, just the full-on generalized seizure. Um, generalized non-motor onset is the new name for abstinence seizures, which is what I just talked about, the spacing out. So it's basically um, 10 seconds or less usually, and they space out. Um, you wouldn't really know it unless you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, but they will stop talking. They will just come back to and, and pick up basically right where they left off, but they have missed whatever you have said in that time. So they lose consciousness, but it's for a very, very brief time. Um, they often, well, not often, but sometimes they can be misdiagnosed as ADD, they, you know, they just day daydream a lot, they're not paying attention, um, they can't focus, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I actually know adults now who were misdiagnosed through their entire childhood, put on Ritalin, you know, the whole gamut, and then later had generalized tonic-clonic and um, linked it back and were like, oh, you were having seizures for like your whole life and labeled as a behavior problem or whatever it was. So. Um, so it's just important to know that as practitioners, if you are working with people who are not diagnosed yet and you see these things happening, to, to talk to them or their parents or whoever it is and help them get to the right care. What is tonic clonic? So tonic clonic means stiffen and jerk. So someone will even actually sometimes have just a tonic seizure, which is just stiffening, no jerking. Um, and they did, they changed it. Um, Generalized motor onset is now what it's called, but um, tonic-clonic is actually way more descriptive than they used to be called grandma. Yeah. Um, grandma, actually, if you translate it, means big and bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, so, um, and not, I mean, in a, I not in a good way, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> right, right, not big and bad. Big and bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and petite mall means little and bad. So, um, you know, I think that once again that language, if you look into the history of epilepsy and um, you just see how that stigma has sort of carried on through the, I mean, since BC basically, <laughs> if you go back in time, you know. But, um, but t good question about what tonic clonic means. So um, that's basically everyone, who, who has seen a tonic clonic? That's yeah. the, when people think of seizures, that's yeah. the type they're thinking. Right, even if you've seen on TV or something, you know. Um, and basically, things to keep in mind with this one are that um, they could lose their bladder or their bowel. Um, and a lot of times when we're coming up with like seizure response plans with um, schools, you know, we take that into consideration. Um, the other thing is, is that um, it usually lasts one to three minutes, so it feels like an eternity, but it really is very, pretty brief. Um, and then also there's a period following it where they're probably not going to be retaining anything that you're doing. So if you guys have, uh, if they have a grant, a uh, tonic-clonic with you in the office, you probably don't want to continue therapy afterwards because it's not going to be effective. So um, give them time to recover. Um, the other thing is to keep in, keep an ear out for as practitioners working with people with epilepsy is discrimination in this regard um, for all the seizures. If sometimes employers or schools, they won't really understand the nuances of the seizure and so they won't know it, but they're not allowing accommodations that they need. So um, I mean, one thought comes to mind was a woman who worked at a hotel, so she, um, they were like, nope, our, our um, hours are 7 a.m. to whatever, um, you have to work that. And she had a lot of nocturnal seizures, and so waking up early and getting going was very hard for her, and so she just wanted to push it back like an hour. I mean, it wasn't like trying to change the entire schedule, but they pushed back, no, 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 you know. Um, she almost lost her job. We went in and trained, and then they were like, oh, okay, so she's not just trying to get out of work or be a pain for us. It's actually valid. <laughs> so, um, you know, just, like, listen for those types of stories, and you might even think that they're really outrageous and your client might be making them up. 
I mean, through the years, I've heard some things that, like, I can't believe that people think that they can get away with it, like employers and schools and, you know, so. Um, seizure first aid for someone who is having that tonic-clonic um, seizure is to two things if you forget everything else. Just stay calm, which is the easiest thing to do, and track the time. You want to make sure that it doesn't, um, if it starts going over five minutes, you want to call 911. That usually means something is not quite right. Um, unless they're typical, some people will have a typical like 10 minute seizure and if you know that about that person, just wait it out. But the usual is one to three minutes, so by five minutes, something's probably not right. Um, and then you want to just cushion their head and move things away. Like you said, protect the person when they're having that. You do not want to move the person away from the objects, but move the objects away. Um, they are uh, usually pretty stiff, and so you could injure them if you try to move them. Um, obviously, you guys don't provide emotional support. Um, it can be embarrassing and a lot of shame and, uh, you know, a lot of fear, actually, about having seizures and where you're going to have seizures. Um, and then I would just say document the activity, and if you do see it happening, um, and you can give that back to the client to like give to their doctor, that's helpful because sometimes, I mean, well, clients don't can't report what happens during their own seizures, you know. Um, so any report of they were on their right side or their left side or you know could be helpful. One thing I'd add to that is, and this actually came from a mind unraveled is. Uh, possibly talking with your clients about how they want you to respond as they're coming out of the seizure. Because of this book, he was very big on he wanted his friends to be joking. That was the signal that everything was okay. Mm -hmm. And bystanders, of course, sat there going, this is morbid. You know, what are you guys doing? But for Kurt, that was what he wanted, uh, that immediate reassurance from them and uh, by joking about it. So I think that's a good question to ask. How do you want me to respond if you come out of the one? Uh, to make to acknowledge to you immediately that you're safe and you're okay. Yeah, and I, a good point because I think out in public too. I mean, if you're ever in a more public situation with somebody having a seizure, trying to get everybody to just go on with their business, <laughs> because you know everyone. I mean, I've heard from so many <laughs> yeah. people that they wake up and everyone is like hovered around them, staring at them, and they don't know what happened, and they're frightened, and it's just. You know, the more you can just kind of handle it as like a normal occurrence, the better off, I think, and whatever they want specifically, yeah. So you said if it's going on beyond like five minutes, time to really start taking note of yeah. what's happening and maybe start the process to call 911? Yeah, okay. definitely. I would say definitely if it's at five minutes um, and time it with a, you know, your mm -hmm. iPhone or something because 30 seconds will feel like it's been five minutes, but um, yeah, definitely be calling 911 at that point. Um, or if they have, have they have versed you on their rescue meds, we'll talk a little bit about rescue meds at the end. Um, you might even want to give the rescue med if you feel comfortable doing that. Usually, that's like in school settings, they're trained by a school nurse. Um, the teachers are in that to give it, so you guys might not feel trained enough to do that, which is fine, um, but just call 911 and they will get the rescue med. So the employee I had was adamant about not calling 911, but I think that brings up the point of having that conversation ahead of time of, okay, well, what if what if you severely bite your tongue and you're bleeding profusely? Can we call then? Yes. You know? <laughs> or what yes. if it's going beyond five minutes? Are you okay if we call then? Totally. So I think having that kind of talk is really key. It sounds like that's really key. Yes, and we have, we have, and you guys could always use or encourage your clients to use in their other situations in life, um, a seizure action plan. And it's actually, it lays everything out. This is my typical seizure. This is how long it usually lasts. This is what you do. Um, if, whatever, you know, I bite my tongue or whatever, then call 911. Um, and it's signed by the neurologist. And so I think that that also is a good liability piece for people because, you know, employers um, might might say, no, no, we have to call 911 every time, which is actually really expensive okay. and traumatic. Um, you know, it makes a huge deal out of something that's a normal occurrence. So, um, so the more you can, like, then educate this employer of, like, hey, there's this liability piece. The doctor is saying that, 
no, you do not need to call 911, then maybe that can change their mind um, of how to deal with it. So. I was going to ask for that. <coughs> um, it's actually in the share drive. I'll just find I it and print it out. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. great. Um, the share drive under, under the nurse. Um, training in the training cool. nurse. Cool. Yeah. I'm following the generalized sonic clinic. Do, do most people feel comfortable driving shortly thereafter or depend on the person? Well, I would not let them drive right after. You, everyone's different, and some people, it's called postictal, like when they're sort of becoming more in tune, can last 30 minutes. Some people okay. can last hours. Um, some people can last five minutes. So, I mean, it's really the gamut, but I think what you could do is um, just kind of gauge their awareness, you know, right. um, what, well, who's the president, <laughs> what's their birthday, what's their name, you know, that kind of thing. And once they can kind of fully answer more questions and also can wake up, I mean, a lot of times they're so sleepy that they're just going to need to sleep. So. And in a perfect world, hopefully they can give you a name of someone to call. Okay. Yes. But I don't know, we had this discussion on Thursday during the professional advisory board, but my understanding has always been if you have a tonic clinic, you really don't have a license for a while. At least growing up in Texas, it was mm -hmm. uh, every seizure six months suspension. They recommend in Colorado that you yeah. don't drive for three months after a seizure, yeah. but it's not. Um, there's they no don't take it. No yeah. yeah, the neurologist yeah. has to make It's that. a no report state. Yeah, so basically the... In Colorado, the epileptologist um, writes it in their records and, and advises the patient, you know, of like, no, you can't drive for three months, six months, whatever they feel is right for that particular client. And then um, and then they put it in the notes, yes, they can drive now. So, I mean, really it's, it's kind of good and it's kind of bad. I mean, because it kind of leaves the onus on the person to do the right thing morally and um, which is difficult when you need to get to work and you need to get the groceries for the family and you need, you know what I mean? And so I get the practical struggle with it, but if they, God forbid, kill somebody on the road, um, they will dig up those records from the epileptologist and the client will be held responsible. So, um, you know, it's important, once again, as therapists, <laughs> to be talking to your clients about that and, and be realistic about what the possible consequences are and can they find alternative transportation for that period of time, you know? Um, it's difficult. That's a difficult one. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> Wait, um, I have one of these um, patients, do they carry something with them? I have this, and then in my wallet, I have the first aid card. Okay. So hopefully um, people are doing that. Yeah, hopefully. That's the yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Once again, um, that's something that we try to educate our clients about, but um, not everybody wants – but you can't even tell. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you do have to be looking for this because no one would know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, – but some people still will be resistant to it. But we, we do have an emergency fund, and we will help people fund medical ID bracelets and things like that. So if you have a client who is struggling financially, um, send them back to us, and we will definitely like help whatever medical ID. Um, obviously, we do screening and all of that. But like we can help with heat bills, phone bills, rent, you know. Just call me. Yeah. Do yeah. you have, because I got this from F code. Do we have ones we could just give providers to keep? Yeah, um, I think I have a stack in my office actually. Okay. If you need more. Um, yep. So um, okay, so focal non-motor onset, and I think that this is a time that your sister may have had, if, judging by how you described it. Um, it's actually it was called um, complex partial for a while, and now it's focal non-motor onset. <laughs> Small kind of developed into this term. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There uh, actually the heat oh, mall sort of encompass absence seizures. Oh, okay. Um, I think this. Is the, is actually, this is simple partial. Oh, this this is a different no. one, but then there's um. Can you more of these? Sorry. This one. Everybody have one. Partial. 
So basically, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Basically, this is a seizure that happens in one um, localized part of the brain, and it will affect um, awareness. It's, someone is not necessarily unconscious, but they're sort of semi-conscious, so they won't. Um, they won't. Actually, they will be able to tell you information about what's happening with this particular one. So they might be having something that looks like a panic attack. They might look like they're having a hallucination or a psychotic episode. Um, and they could just even have a smell that's not there, a taste that's not there. So it really depends on the person. Once again, you get to know the person and get to know what their seizures are. Um, like, yeah, like at camp we've had this and um, a girl was hyperventilating and having a lot of what appeared to be anxiety but it was and panic, but it was it was this type of seizure. So sometimes the good news about this type of seizure is that um, for a lot of people it will be a, a sign that they're about to have a tonic-clonic. So it will allow them to drive. It will allow them to, you know, sit down and get it to a safe spot before they have the seizure. Um, but the bad news is it can be really frightening for people um, and mimic mental health issues. So, so you said it could look like a panic attack and what else? Um, they could be hallucinating. Like one girl, she'd have the hallucination that um, hordes of people were entering her room, uh, like strangers, and, and it was like she would scream and, you know, it was frightening. Um, so hallucinating, things that aren't there. Um, the smell was always the real big thing for my sister. Smell and taste. She, we'd call them, instead of spells, we'd call them smells. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, it, was, it was scary for her because as soon as that started to come on, she'd be looking for one of us and then, you know, the seizure would happen. So. Like, yeah, what does that mean? Like they would smell things that we can't? Or? Yeah. Well, they probably aren't even there. Almost like just a part of your brain that's, you know, telling you something that's not. Yeah. She couldn't describe what it smelled like, but it was like this very weird smell. Yeah, like how she would say. say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. As far that's as the taste. Like the that's often what people yeah. say. Do you have this? I, I don't. I unfortunately, don't have any auras or indicators of an onset of a seizure. I just wake up afterwards. Yeah. And that's what you'll hear. You that term aura. Um, I have auras before my seizure. Well, the aura is a seizure in and of itself. Yeah. So um, just know that. Um. Yeah, as, as mental health people, I think um, it would just be important to sort of weed out what, is there mental health issues or is it just seizures? Because <laughs> it can really be um, Okay, so focal um, motor onset, this is what used to be called the complex partial. Sorry, all the terms changed recently and I mean, I'm still getting used to it. I think it's all for the good because I think it's becoming more medically like separated. But um, but it just is complex when you're talking to people. So um, uh, this is where they are partially impaired with their um, cognition, I guess, or their awareness. So um, they might be walking around. They might seem like they're responding to you, but they don't really, they're not saying anything coherent. Um, they might have an odd, odd Automatism, which is like picking at their shirt or something repetitive, maybe smacking their lips repetitively. Um, and then this usually lasts one to three minutes as well. They might just be sitting there. They're not always walking around, but they could be. Um, and they will also have a postictal stage after this, usually too, of, you know, sort of a time of getting, um, they're tired, they might have a headache, they might be losing consciousness. And the big thing with this is that they have a tendency to become combative sometimes, or even the seizure itself will look kind of aggressive sometimes. So um, it, it can, this is what we educate law enforcement about, and these are the ones that you hear, oh, I had a seizure and I was arrested, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, it can look like drunken, drunkenness, it can look like they're up to something criminal, um, and so, what to do for this one is, once again, stay calm. It's also, it, has anyone seen one of these? Okay, because it, it is definitely um, a little bit unnerving too, you know, kind of like a tonic clinic, um, because you're like, what's happening? <laughs> and they're walking around maybe and stuff. So um, what you 
the only thing I would say, stay calm, track the time, once again, five minute rule, and do not try to restrain them. Um, you can gently touch them and guide them away from hazards, but um, often standing in front of them will guide them away too. So like if they're headed down a flight of stairs or something like that, you, you could, you know, guide them. But what you don't want to do is talk in an aggressive voice or um, really like grab them. <laughs> Um, it actually looks like, think of someone who is um, sleepwalking and, you know, sleep, and not the gentle sleepwalking, but like the more aggressive sleepwalking, that is kind of what it looks like. So, and it actually, some, sometimes in the middle of the night, it's hard to weed that out. Are they sleepwalking or are they having a seizure? So, um, and people with that particular type of seizure will, I think he talks about it in his book, but like they'll end up like mm -hmm. in random places, right. like a cro like middle of the night down, you know, down the street, and they're like, how did I get? They come, you know. So it's scary for people. So, um, okay, seizure triggers, um, flashing lights. Of course, everybody's probably heard of that one. That's actually not the most common um, trigger, but it's something to be aware of. And um, the most common is Mr. Late Medication. So just making sure, you know, that you're helping your clients with self-management and taking that medication relatively on time, like within an hour of when they should be taking it. Um, stress and anxiety, as Mark talked about, that's a big one. Um, lack of sleep is another big one. So um, these are things to be asking if, if their seizures have increased and you're noticing differences, you know, they may not know that these are triggers, but these would be things to be sort of coaching them on. Hormonal changes, um, it can be positive or negative. Um, a lot of people will, like around puberty, puberty, maybe that's when it either gets worse or it gets better, or menopause gets worse or better. Um, even just cycles, um, you know, when you're ovulating or whatever. Um, Common illnesses, overheating is another big um, trigger for people, and dehydration. So, um, kind of just self care, you know. <laughs> and with um, seizures as a general rule, shouldn't like use alcohol. I was always told to reduce it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, they never said to stop, but uh, yeah, definitely not good for some. Yeah, and especially like the, the, like, binging, you know, the getting, like, wasted. That is what I've heard is, like, the big trigger. It's a glass of wine, a beer, whatever. It's not, you know, don't do it at all. But, um, yeah. But, like, that's why college kids are often at a higher risk of, of like, sudden unexplained death and epilepsy and other things um, because, I think their lifestyle is like all the triggers and they, you know, a lack of sleep, yeah. they drinking, meals are off, everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was diagnosed right before my senior year in high school, so I dealt with a lot of that, especially going into college and a lot of resistance to doctors are wrong. This isn't really happening to me because it was infrequent enough for me to convince myself this wasn't happening. And then, of course, I wouldn't take my meds. I'd I joined a fraternity, which was just an instant slap in the face of my doctor. Um, so, um, so it takes some time to wrap your head around and accept it. And I, I was fortunate to get out of that period of my life. We're partially okay. Yeah, that and that is a true thing about the denial, um, the journey. I mean, as you all know, with everything, I think if you work with chronic illnesses, I mean, I think that's pretty common to have that stage of denial, and for some people it can last for a long time, and for some people it's relatively quickly come to terms with it, but um, yeah, that's kind of scary when it's college and like all those triggers. Um, so status epilepticus, this is the kind of the, the worst thing that can happen, and this is um, where the seizure goes on and on and won't stop. Um, I've known kids who have had seizures for like six hours before they stop it, obviously. Brain damage is occurring at that point, and um, it's not a situation that you want to happen. So um, that would not be on your time. That would be, you would have called 911. They would be dealing with it, but um, just be
be aware that that is why we have that five minute rule um, and where you can sort of get ahead um, because the longer a seizure goes on for, the longer it, it can last. So I always thought that, because I was always taught that after three minutes, then the seizure needs to be conducting for brain damage. No, um, it's actually 30 to 60 minutes before brain damage occurs. So, and I and I want to make that clear about the five minute rule because it's not five minutes. Oh my gosh, something bad is going to happen right now. You know, it's more just once again getting ahead of it, um, and and then yeah, it gives time for emergency to get there, for them to treat them, for the medicine to take you know take hold. So it really you have some time to spare when you're at that five minute mark. You have at least twenty five maybe even, what, 55 minutes, so. Um, this is reminding me of a book I read recently, if anyone's interested, it's called The Spirit Catches You yes. When You Fall oh, Down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a fascinating book about yeah. a young um, mom girl who has a seizure, feedback seizure disorder. Yeah. And like the culture of the American medical system versus mom culture, and it's yeah. just fascinating. And what she enters it? into child protection. The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down. Really yeah, yeah. yeah. Really I actually, um, I saw I was a child protection social worker in Minneapolis. Yeah. Okay. And Minneapolis has yeah. the largest Hmong community that there is, and so I read that book back then, and wow. and then now I'm working in epilepsy. So, um, anyway, it all connects. But yes, it's a great um, book about once again like cultural yeah. things, but also maybe stigma and ignorance of, of everybody, you know, and yeah. So um, when is a seizure an emergency? When it, I, we talked, when it's over the five minute mark. Also, if it's a first time seizure, so if you're seeing a client and you do not know that they have epilepsy and they have a seizure, call 911. It could be for some other reason and it also needs to be monitored, diagnosed, and all of that. Um, repeated seizures without gaining consciousness, so this is, um, so this does, happen to a fair amount of people where they will have clusters is what they call it. Um, sometimes these people though will have, we'll call, talk about um, some uh, treatment devices, so like a VNS and that can sort of interrupt the, the cluster, but if they don't then I would just, um, you know, call 911 and, and make sure that they're getting help. Um, if a person is injured, as we talked about, if they, you know, fall and hit their head and it's bleeding everywhere, you obviously want to get help. Have diabetes, that's a whole different ball game than epilepsy, and um, if they're pregnant. And if it happens in water, but I don't foresee you guys doing therapy at the same school, so it probably won't happen on your time. Um, Back to therapy, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so sudden unexplained death and epilepsy, we talked a little bit about this, this um, is the leading cause of death with people with uncontrolled seizures. So if you ha if someone is having uncontrolled, particularly tonic-clonic seizures, they're kind of put on a high risk category um, for feedback. Um, and the exact cause is not known, more research is definitely needed. There's, we have a SUDEP inst Institute which provides counseling and bereavement with support for people, but also um, focuses on our research. And so they are kind of gaining some knowledge about SUDEP, and they do think it has to do with the heart and the lungs and the brain signals to those organs. It's not just they've suffocated in bed or something. People who are at a higher risk of SUDEP happening too are people who are sleeping alone. So. Um, that is often why people want seizure dogs, you know, who will alert a caregiver or why parents, I mean, rightfully so, but this is not a great situation where they sleep with their teenager <laughs> um, because they're too afraid that this is going to happen during the night. So, um, but anyone who actually is alone and has a seizure is at risk of this happening. Um, it, it could happen any other, like if they're if you're there to help, but it's very, very unlikely that it's going to happen when they have somebody there helping them. So, um, college students, we always encourage them to get roommates, um, that kind of thing, just so that they're not at that risk of being alone. Um, so, NES, non-epileptic seizures. Have any of you guys um, 
done therapy with anybody with? Okay. So a couple. So you guys have a, have an idea. Of what that's it's yeah. not therapy, but it's my mother-in-law. <laughs> oh, oh, really? I don't tell her it's therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't, you don't get paid for She's on anti-seizure meds, so she hasn't had them for many years, but she she would black out on so she finally gave up her driver's license, thankfully. Interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. So, but now with the medication, it seems to oh. keep her. She sees lights when she goes in a dark room. Yeah. That's about the only thing I'm hearing that she experiences as a tail end of that. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting because, well, normally with NES, um, the med medication doesn't work. Oh, um, anti seizure med. I mean, it could be a psychological thing, too, that, like, she thinks. I don't know, um, so I'm not here to say that it's not good. <laughs> but um, but often that's how you might know that it's NES is because they have continued activity even though they're on meds. But really, the only way to really um, di get this diagnosed is to have them go into an EMU and do the EEG, and then they can notice that like during seizure activity there is no actual brain activity happening, um, no no seizure brain. Activity. Oh, okay. oh, so I think you're asking. Um, so uh, epilepsy monitoring unit, and usually it's like for about 72 hours, and they'll um, it's in the hospital in a special unit where they hook them up, you know, with electrodes. There's actually a girl who, a teenage girl who does a video. You can see it on our website, and um, it's good. It, it prepares people for like what to expect in an EMU. Um, and anyway, and then they put them under like the, the triggers, you know, so they can't sleep. I mean, it's pretty unpleasant. They can't sleep. They don't eat much. They, you know, and they're put under all these flashing lights. And um, anyway, just Does like, every hospital have a unit like that. Not every <laughs> hospital. There are special. A lot of them do now. Um, and but usually they're where like a epileptologist yeah. is. Um, an epileptologist is somebody who specializes in epilepsy. Um, so a general neurologist, if someone is just being treated by a general neurologist, that often is not enough. Um, they don't, you know, they know the gamut of neurological disorders. They don't specialize in epilepsy. So, so there can be seizures, uh, n not a lifelong situation, but like my mother-in-law, where she had some for a little while, but they're not non-epileptic either because it's not chronic. Right? Uh, or not ongoing? No, they could be non epileptic and not be ongoing. It, I know she had a stroke. This is probably about 10 years ago, so maybe something stroke going on around that time. That okay. Must be, okay. I mean, like the actual biological mm -hmm. epilepsy. Okay. Um, but it's hard to tell because yeah. honestly, these seizures mimic um, real, I mean, well, I hate to say real because these are real too, but um, actual biological seizures. So. Okay. Can you help me understand, I mean, I think we're getting at it, like psychogenic, because it kind of implies maybe um, uh, psychosomatic? Yes, it is. Exactly. So it is? NES, yes, yeah. That's exactly. I mean, for the most part. Uh, yeah. And that's why the EEG is really the only way you can determine that, because one, you have to have a seizure while you're hooked up to the EEG, but if there's no brain activity occurring during that seizure, then it's NES and more of a psychosomatic situation. Um, can you have epilepsy and? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In fact, many many people do. My my theory in working with this throughout the years, um, and particularly in here, I'll forward for a minute. Um, I'll go back. But um, okay, that's fine. Um, my ticket's not necessarily factitious or or like just someone faking. Not at all. Yeah, and that's actually really important to understand because sometimes, honestly, it can sort of feel like that when you see it, and you kind of want to be like, I mean, it's easy to go to that. They're just faking it. It's not real. Um, but it is very real to <laughs> them. Um, at camp, actually, sometimes our um, our like medical personnel will be like, Diastat is a rescue med that is a rectal one that some people use, and obviously nobody wants that. So they'll be like, if it goes on and on and on, well, we're going to have to give you diastat if you don't come out of it. And there, there, there is a conscious element to this because they hear it and they come out, you know. <laughs> but it's so, but it, they're not faking it. 
it's a right. very yeah. weird thing to explain to people, I think. Hard to understand, but it's definitely psychological, like, like deep psychological. And a lot of doctors and neurologists, I think, don't do a great job of explaining that to the right. patients yeah. who get diagnosed. Absolutely. And, like um, totally. Like, yeah, you're faking it. Her neurologist never wants to, he's very noncommittal on diagnosis. It's very hard to get information out of him. I would <laughs> have her commit. Is she an epileptologist? No, she says she's a neurologist. See, yeah, I would have her go to an epileptologist. I mean, they're managed now on the meds. Yeah, that's like true. That, but you never know, I guess. But if, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, uh, so, uh, and the other thing about this, um, it often stems, and there is a slide, I saw it earlier, but um, with kids at least, a lot of times you see that they have epilepsy and then they develop these. Um, and I, I do think it's because of the trauma almost from having epilepsy. It becomes a trauma that they live with. So, um, and then they, they start to develop this as like a coping sort of strategy. Um, and then a lot of times for adults and children, it, it is based on trauma. Um, so I think it's 80% of has sexual abuse history. I don't know if that, that is what I've read. I do not know if that is actually true. Um, and I would say with the lay population who don't have epilepsy, that statistic 80% sexual abuse might be true. But with epilepsy, I see it a lot more with kids who are just, or people who are just traumatized by having this disorder that everybody stigmatizes and, you know, they've lost jobs and they've been put in some pretty bad situations. So, um, even discharging trauma, you can shake and have what looks like a seizure, but it's not a seizure. So I don't know if yeah. that. It's appropriate to check out which also could look like a seizure. So I'm yeah. wondering yeah. if, if yeah. that the, if these seizures look different than like somebody discharging trauma. I say, well, the ones I've seen do. Um, okay. And actually, there are some telltale signs they that. This is a whole nother course that we're going to teach because it is pretty deep, but there are some telltale Trump, uh, um, signs that, this, that it is NES and not a true seizure. Um, for instance, like they're with a true, with a, a seizure, biological seizure, um, their eyes will be open. With this type of NES seizure, their eyes will be closed. Or how, so uh, stuff like that. How could you tell the difference between an NES and somebody discharging trauma? Because it actually looks, I mean, like picture a tonic clonic seizure. Yeah, it looks like that. It looks like that. Yeah. It's just there's like nuances mm -hmm. that like if, if you know NES, you would know. Like they're um, during a tonic clonic, both sides of their body move in the same rhythm. If, if they're having NES, it often will be like that. Or they hip thrust more <laughs> during an NES. I, I did. So, and those would not be typical releasing trauma sort of, you're not laying on the ground like doing like the, the tonic clonic. I mean, it looks very similar. Does that make sense? To a seizure, to a tonic clonic. Usually like people's primary care doctors can differentiate if they get a good like history of the symptoms. Okay. But sometimes I, I think it looks pretty similar. So even their PCP will refer to neurology for testing and that. Yeah. So you, so if you uh, say it this way, if I were doing therapy with somebody and they went into an episode like this, I would think they were having a seizure. I wouldn't think they were releasing trauma because it's going to look more like a seizure. So, uh, like I haven't witnessed this. I've witnessed it a like small, but I've heard in um, like my trauma training that people as they're Processing in their trauma, they fall on the floor and they're shaking. But it's a, 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 it, I don't know if it looks like an epilepsy drug. Yes, it can, yeah. If, there, if you have NES, it, it certainly can. And there's a huge overlap with the NES and just dissociation in general. Uh -huh. If you want to read more about it, I've, I've been getting into this recently, so I'm, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm just wondering, like, could NES be related to, like, trauma release, or is it, like, oh, no, yeah. there's different mm -hmm. problems. So. Yes. Yeah. There's a, like I think you said 80%. I think it's pretty close to 80% of people with NES have a history of some kind of abuse in their, okay. their past. So. This is a good workbook, Treating Non-Epileptic Seizures. This is the therapist's guide and then the
client to get the workbook as well. And it's a very structured kind of 12 session thing. Um, I mean, you probably don't need this because you've been doing a ton of research on it, but if you want to get in this and start, this is a good kind of starting place to just understand how uh, he's a psychiatrist, Kurt LaFrance, who's very big on the National Epilepsy Foundation, who put this together. And it's, it gives you a lot of good ideas, not only for NES, but for people with epilepsy because that stress component is so important to them. Uh, <clears throat> do you guys know if some of the trauma treatments like brain spotting or uh, EMDR, how people with epilepsy or NES respond, or is it like a contraindicated? Or the, I, I guess it, the research I've seen um, is on CBT, and that's probably the most. It was I, I think especially with like a mindfulness component is good for this population. But there's other stuff that hasn't been studied. It's just like an understudied area. That's exactly but I think like a lot of treatments can be effective. I think especially like body focus treatments like EMDR. They tend to avoid the light bar or the flashing. Yeah, yeah traffic. Yeah. So like you can have the <laughs> simulation, but not necessarily with lights or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I it's it's actually honestly. It, I mean, it's just been kind of truly identified in probably the last five years. I mean, um, I mean, they they well because they used to call it um, conversion disorder. No, they used to call it um, when they first started. Do you remember? No. It it, it actually implied that they were faking it. Whatever. It was called. No. I remember people coming in with like, temporal lobe epilepsy. That no, but that's the focal. Yeah, that's focal. Um, Hold on, hold on. I'll think of it. I'll think of it throughout this time. But it was, but it was hard oh, to actually to say. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, I mean it was hard for me to say because it was pretty much telling people like, oh yeah, you're faking it. Like this is your diagnosis. You know. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, totally. And and they were told by neurologists that they, they didn't understand it. it. And they were like, yeah, you're not having. Uh, go, you know, go away basically, and then they're left to deal with it. So, I mean, talk about trauma. Right. I mean, it's like if they had trauma, and then they are treated like that, and then they continue to have ongoing trauma. I mean, it becomes so treatment. Me my point is, treatment methods I think are all <laughs> under being studied. Like, yeah. And I, 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 I read a book by Lorna Myers. I think you and I were talking about yeah. her. She's out of New York, but she she would say that the kind of treatment is less important than the clinician being really familiar with this mm -hmm. diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So your slides show a lot of what we just talked about. Um, oh, it, it is. I do like this. Coordination between multidisciplinary providers is necessary with mental health provider being responsible for coordination of care. So I would say that it would be important to get releases and talk to the neurologist or epilepsy. Hopefully they're seeing an epileptologist if they're having this type of seizure. If they're not, I would highly recommend that they go to an epileptologist and get into, you know, an EMU and, and do the whole gamut. Um, but I, that often would be led by you guys to reach out to the doctor. The doctor, the way the culture is right now, the doctor is not likely to reach out to you guys and say, this is what's happening with my client and can you guys help? It just isn't where we're at. So um, here you go. Here's the risk factors. You guys can read through those. Those are kind of what we talked about. I mean, just trauma, you know, for both adults and youth. Um, but youth, it, it can often come in other, you know, bullying and um, not necessarily familial. That's right. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And veterans are actually at a higher risk of epilepsy in general because of the brain injury factor. So um, just so you know, they did a study on, I, I find this fascinating, they did a study on um, Vietnam vets and 65% developed epilepsy. Um, who came back with brain injury? 65% developed epilepsy over a 15-year period. So, 
if that tells you anything about how it goes with brain injury, a lot of times people will have a brain injury and be like, well, I had a brain injury two years ago. I don't have seizures. I'm fine. Well, it could develop, you know, 10 years later. So you don't really know. You don't want to scare the person, but, you know, you don't really know until you know. So, yeah. Um, I saw a ketogenic diet. Yes. So a lot, with a lot of these, the fat, um, yeah. the, the fat diet that it is, the, yeah. would these treatment options also um, be good for epileptic seizures? Or these are for epileptic seizures, not oh. for NES. Oh. NES is um, really the only treatment that they have identified is, is like therapy treatment. Okay. You know? so, oh, I see. Like conversion. Since treatment. it's not happening in the brain or yes. they haven't identified any body. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So this is treatment options for epilepsy, not NES. Um, and basically they'll always start with medication. If you fail three-ish, there's it really lowers your chance of any other medication working for you. There are many, many medications on the market now though. Um, so there's probably about 30. Um, so, you know, doctors have have a way of knowing which ones work with which um, seizure types and, and will hopefully identify that. But if if they haven't, and this can often take two over, I mean, a year to a year and a half of trial. So um, that that part is difficult to deal with as well, you know, because it's not just like, hey, I go and I get a pill and then I'm just fine. And, you know, it's more like this process and then maybe they fail a med and then that's disappointing. And, back to square one and, you know, that kind of thing. So alternatives, well, about 20% um, about are not, 20 to 30% are not, um, do not respond to medication. So, um, and the other 80%, it's, it's really only 30% are seizure-free. And then there's about 30 to 40% that are still experiencing something. Um, so anyway, surgery is an option that um, that's obviously pretty drastic, um, brain surgery. So that's often when they're at a point of more desperation and, you know, this is the last resort. Ketogenic diet, you mentioned, um, it is the fad now, but it's really not a fun diet to be on when you have to be on it. Um, so just know that it is monitored through hospitals and kidneys and liver and everything because could be affected by this diet because it's so extreme. Um, and then the modified Atkins diet is a little easier to live with, but it's um, not probably as great of results either. So keto diet, though, has been researched for years and years, and a lot of people will respond well to it, and they will, um, some kids that I know um, were on it for like two years, and then now they're seizure free. They're back on regular diets and hmm. seizure free still. So it can really do magic if it's with the right person. Um, BNS, that is a... Um, Can I go back to yes. you know, something I read and came that it was best for children? Is that true? That's what it's been used with more, um, and I think more of that is because parents can control their diet. Um, right. So, it, you know, once they get to be, like, independent, it's really hard to know, are they going to the vending machine and getting, you know, and, and literally, like, a race. <coughs> can throw it off. So it's like, you know, if they break it at all, it's, you know, so. Yeah. Yep. Um, which is basically starvation mode. So, yeah. Uh, not fun. Um, VNS, though, is a device that is inserted into the chest cavity, has a vagal nerve um, stimulator that goes up to the vagal nerve in the brain, and um, it, like, sends electrical impulses up to the brain. And it is, once again, validated and it works and you can, they'll have a magnet that you can swipe um, over the, usually the left side of their chest, you can kind of see the device. So you can swipe it, just ask your client to kind of teach you how to do that. They can swipe it, I mean, you can swipe it when they aren't having a seizure, you're not going to hurt them. Um, it just sort of reprograms, resets the thing. So. Um, NRS is another form of VNS. It's just in the brain. It doesn't have a magnet that goes along with it, so there's nothing you do 
would do as a bystander and just sort of send some messages. Um, and then obviously counseling and therapy, which I think is good for anyone with epilepsy and NES, um, just with all of the trials. What about EMDR? Um, Mark, do you know? I don't think there's ever really been a connection made okay. between the two. Um, I, I like EMDR, mm -hmm. but I don't think from an epileptic perspective that there's much have an effect. Yeah. Okay. It's not been done or it's not shown? I don't think there's been a lot of research done on it. And uh, to your point earlier, there are some concerns with like the lighting and everything that's part of it. about like the sounds, you know, things like the auditory you're doing. Um, I don't know about auditory. Type of EMDR. It's not a visual, mm -hmm. it's more the, the sound of in one side or the other. I, I don't know if, if the sound would trigger anything or, or be concerning. I just don't know if there's enough evidence out there to show that. Okay. Good to know. Can I go back to that lights and sounds for a minute? Um, my mom used to get that she used to get seizures, like going to where she can't drive anymore because of the way the sun goes in and out. Yep. Um, trees. Okay. Yep. And then strobe lights. Is that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, she was talking about the EEG. Uh, I used to do what they called at the time sleep deprived EEGs. And the first thing they started with was the strobe lights. I mean, just truly, like, right in front of you. <laughs> Are those, is that the photo sensor? Yeah, the flashing lights. Oh, okay. Yeah. And is that rare? Because I had this debate with my nephew, and then I looked it up, and it said it was rare, but it was not. As a trigger? It's not. It's not rare. It's not as common as you might think. You do hear about it more, yeah. I think, than the other triggers, but it's not. Um, it's not rare. And you do have to be. If if you have that, you have to be careful. Like even going. I know. I've been triggered going to like ASCII, you know, you know the lights that go around, or just places like random things like that that you don't really think about, or the, the trees. I've heard <coughs> that a lot. Yeah. yeah, and is that like, I'm going to sound real dumb here for a second because I am like just learning about the seizures, but um, like why does that trigger the brain, or how does that trigger the brain? Is so, it like a circuit overload kind of thing? I mean, I think at the highest level, it's uh, an electrical abnormality in the brain that as your brain is trying to process those lights, it just kind of malfunctions. Excessive stimulus? Yeah. What is it? Excessive stimulus. Excessive stimulus. But there are times, like at movies or other places, where I just put my head down. Uh, the Incredibles, too. There was a big oh, warning yeah. that came out about it. Uh, but we <laughs> went and saw it anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was very clear of when I needed to just kind of put my head down. And then my wife would be like, yeah, you can you know, look again. But uh, th that's never been a major trigger for me. The hyperventilation during the EEG was uh, more. But to your point, it was missing medication and stress were, are the biggest things. And is that like how, like just one way it could be a possible link to like autism because of the overload and the or load? Oh, my God. Overload. <laughs> yeah, like the sensory stuff. And the sensory. <laughs> Yeah. It feels like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The interesting thing in working with, especially kids with epilepsy for so long, is that <coughs> the autism point. Um, there's a crossover with autism and epilepsy, so we do get kids with autism and epilepsy at camp. That being said, I've also have a history of working with fragile X syndrome kids, which are very similar to autism, so I know autism pretty well. And um, epilepsy kids, some of them. Don't, are not diagnosed with autism, definitely have some of the same characteristics as autistic kids. So like some of the social, like lack of social skills, yeah, and, um, and sensory issues. Um, and I don't know what that, in fact, like sort of the movement is now is that like some, some of the um, programs, some parents are getting their like kids and autism programs to help with epilepsy, you know, to help with their, like, social skills and things like that because they're, they overlap. And I don't know. I just think there's, I just think it's fascinating. And there should be more I research don't. on it. I don't, I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it could be that seizures are changing something in the brain, you know, um, through, through development, and may end up causing something that looks similar to autism in the end, you know, where they weren't born that way. It's more like a slow change, you know? Anyway, side note <laughs> from my life perspective. But, um, okay, so um, what do we need to talk about? Just be aware of um, behavior and mood changes with the medications. So if you're working with people who are expressing, um, they've had, you know, they have so much more depression now, and like, oh, they link it back to like when they started this med. That's definitely a real thing. Um, people with epilepsy struggle with depression and anxiety anyway, about 50%, um, which I think is actually a low estimate. Um, but then you put these, you know, medications on top of it um, that change your brain and who knows what you're going to end up with. So um, behavior, there are certain medications that cause like pretty serious behavior changes for some kids at least. Um, so that is real. Um, it's a true thing. And these are just com common side effects. We don't have to go through them all, but um, if they're having these side effects, they should definitely go back and see their doctor. Um, sort of the, the culture now is to find that balance in life, not just to be seizure free and be miserable in every other aspect of your life. So ketogenic diet we kind of talked about. Um, any questions on that? So, that's not, so the ketogenic diet is, sorry, <laughs> is or is not recommended for somebody who has Parkinson's or liver kidney? Well, probably not, I would say. I mean, it would be important just to talk to their doctor and see if it's an option for them, but um, uh, that is often what suffers. Okay. So, yeah. Um, we already talked about the brain changes. Oh, I guess I jumped ahead. Sorry about that. Um, so, so these are rescue medications that you might hear people talk about. Um, Versed is a nasal <laughs> um, version of a a rescue med and diastat diazepam is a rectal. So Versed is not FDA approved yet, but most schools have moved to using it anyway. So um, and most people, most kids, not necessarily adults, but most kids are actually given a rescue med nowadays, regardless, um, and just to like in case and to have on hand. So just so you know, most most people will come with some sort of rescue med as an option. Like I said, to use these sort of legally, like in schools and stuff, a uh, school nurse needs to train the lay person. Um, so I don't know how that translates to all of you as therapists. I mean, you could probably give it as just a lay person, um, but you might not. It'd be your decision if you want to do that or not. Diazepam, isn't that like a generic of Valium? Because I used to take it in pill form for vertigo yeah. on a very small dose. Okay. Yeah, and it's um, it's a different, I don't understand the medical, like medically what exactly it is. Yeah. But it's definitely different than the kind that they use like in the, in the hospital. Okay. Um, the hospital version has a lot of like side effects and could like inhibit breathing and like, you know, um, but this version has no side effects. Okay. It's totally safe to use. So, yeah. Interesting. Anyway. Cool. <laughs> okay. So, break time, but yes. right? And then Mark will address the mental health. So, I mean, we kind of have throughout, but you'll address it more. Like Absolutely. I'd say five, ten minutes, and then we'll come back together. And I'll just tell you there's a lot of good information in here that you can take with you. Yeah. Uh, but we'll probably just have more of a discussion. I don't think anyone needs to learn what automatic thoughts are and <laughs> thoughts, feelings, and actions and all that. So we're just going to talk about what you might see in sessions with people. So, all right. Obviously, people's heads are usually not that size. 
<laughs> but I think that <laughs> I that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I can see right through you. Right, exactly. So the the okay. So the this is the our our um our nest real size, and the this is what it looks and feels like. I think I've got a VNS one. Can I take a picture? Yeah, please. Do not answer. So that 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 um, that so that actually is what gets get them planted. Oh, um, ours obviously, I think it says do not implant because you know it doesn't have the active stuff in it. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing it on surgery or anything. So disclaimer. Um, yeah, seriously, this, this, this is what a V B N S is like. And that's that 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 makes sense. that's one that gets yeah. implanted here. Okay. Yeah, and then there's a magnet to stimulate that. Oh, View California. So that's the Wellington thing. Yeah. <laughs> I got the table. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> before you go, um, okay, so as kind of an announcement, my attention goes uh -huh. wayward too. So this, <laughs> this is the one that they actually put in the brain. Okay, and so how does this work? Um, it's like an electrical sort of like a stimulator. Okay. So the idea is is that some people have like the electrical activity. Um, makes a seizure start, okay. you know, so it's like a, a spark, mm -hmm. so it just like regulates the electrical activity oh, okay. for somebody instead of the like burst. Yeah. Oh, yeah, neat. same with the vagal nerve. I mean, it's the same idea. And the chest cavity, and then it goes up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. which is why, like, even if they have a VNS, okay. um, yeah, yeah. and yeah. they have a seizure, kind of the you can swipe it. Yeah, and it's yeah. Um, I the can seizure activity you by sending why, out electrical impulses. Um, and VNS yes, lines to call. That, okay. Have, you know, so what so is yeah, like that? that? It's a magnet. They don't even like wear it on their wrists a lot of times or on their, like, so like on his um, braces, is that that metal thing? Is that what no, it's a, he doesn't have it. Um, have it. Um, it's, it's like round. Okay. Yeah, 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 of course. I just did a quick Google search and it was like all the <laughs> well, and 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 it's tough because um, I have, there is a client who calls me probably once every three weeks or so because I think I'm getting the, the impression that she she has P P N E S and she's mad that her neurologist won't give 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 her medication and then this neurologist has told other people she's tried to see like hey don't give her meds but um, because it's P P N E S you can't treat that with meds. That, that's what I'm, I'm thinking is happening, but she always calls us. She's so mad at the neurologist because she doesn't help her. So I think a lot of that is part of those, those part of those reviews. I mean, so Kurt's, Kurt's book, he saw a couple doctors, and this, this was like 30, 40 years ago. Um, but doc, doctors were over-prescribing. They didn't li they, 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 they didn't li listen to him, and that still happens. Just not yeah. as often, thankfully. So I always try to keep a balanced view when folks are calling and saying, "My neurologist won't." Do yeah. a, B, C. Yeah. The book is fantastic. Oh, um, I put it on my audible. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been here for about four, four, four months now, and I'm like, it's been like a super steep learning curve for me. And so when I read that book, I was like, uh -huh, okay. I was like, okay, this all makes sense. Um, I get when, when people are calling me, why they're asking me the questions that they're asking. And um, I mean, again, a lot of this stuff, the, the, the stuff that he's dealt with, his, oh, hopefully in the past, with yeah. the passage of the ADA, I guess I um, it. Doc, yeah, man, I, doctors being I don't know if I told you, I'm going through this book called The Haunted Self incompetent that uh, and our um, Afra, 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 Afra recommended to me. So, so, um, and so it's really technical. So, so it's kind of hard, to, really hard to get through. I've got to take it in and chunks. He's, but, he, he, he's but yeah, just a huge really overlap with dissociated no, like some of the pretty severe try, mental health stuff. Share, yeah. Like in that book, they actually it's, talk a lot about uh, DID and almost more than I'm interested in, but 
but yeah, it's been but, um, I don't it was pretty enlightening now. just to see, oh, like, I mean, if people have, like, you and know, him disassociation to that extent, cool. like, for some he pretty sincere stuff, it's probably happened for them, so you just got to be ready um, for well, that. What he, yeah. what he, he had the to the of my, my, my book. I'm like, hey, I don't have that blessing, but I have a job now. Deep you're diving into it. Ah, yeah. He said that like I said, I'm like really nerding out of it. Yeah, that's that neat. He, <laughs> he had said that, 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 that the help that a not, not knowledgeable ther- therapist can provide is just, I, I, I don't even know the word, like, you yeah. know. Yeah. So um, if, if you have the time, it really is a great yeah. Is yeah. there anybody else here from Colorado Springs? You are? Okay. What, sorry, what, um, I'm in the process of relocating down there, I opened a private practice in the downtown executive. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm off of Woodman and Academy in a yoga studio. They're former neighbors, and they wanted me in there, so <laughs> I just opened last fall. So, uh-huh. yeah. yeah, I just opened it in August. And okay. I was with Aspen Point for a little over a year, and then now I'm on my own, so yeah. just oh, kind of watching that. Yeah. So that's cool. Do you have a card? Is there an epilepsy well, foundation in, in, in Colorado Springs? No. We, okay, we, that's okay. We, we, we have a support group there, and we, we, we have, like, I, I wouldn't say it's a branch, but it's uh, volunteers who help bring events down there. So we have a 5K there. Um, oh, nice. they're, 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 their support group is really active. And, and it's really cool. How do I find out where they need? Or yep, they so need if, if, if you go to our website at, at epilepsy, found, 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 or, no, epilepsy, epilepsy Colorado, okay. dot org, I think. Um, Oh yeah, the one that's on your brochure. Yeah. Okay. And 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 then there there there's like a get help tab. Mm-hmm. And if you click support groups or okay. And 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 then we 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 have lists of them across the state. Okay. Which is super super awesome. cool. Yeah. You can also sign up for the distribution list to get announcements about like when the 5K will be. In okay. Colorado I think yeah. I'm already getting the newsletter. Okay. So okay. It's probably okay. In that. Yeah, it's okay. probably in there. Yeah, good. Okay. Cool. You've jumped in and done great. Well, thanks. I yeah. do what I can. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, oh, over on our wall here, we it's, it's, it's kind of our resource walls. We have pamphlets, pam, pam, pamphlets, and flyers and cards. So, if you're interested at at, at um, you know, when 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 we're finished, when we're finished today, if 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 you want to peruse that and grab whatever looks good to you, so we've got we have these and we we have more. So just take whatever looks good. Uh, yes, you can ask. Um, Marcy, not today. Um, today was just going to be a general. Yes, actually, is that right up there? Get to know, but we are going to be doing.
sense to be in a
which is kind of weird to say because not everyone does that. And even in our last project uplift, we had a lady who had been diagnosed for over 25 years and was still just so angry. And uh, she kept repeating a point that I, I think is so true. And she said, you know, compared to other brain conditions, there's such a stigma around epilepsy. Someone with, you know, Alzheimer's disease, people feel sad for them. They want to support them. But when you say you have epilepsy, you know, everyone thinks you have the plague or something. And for me personally, I think that's because of just how um, violent and acute uh, the seizures are. People feel helpless. You know, for someone with Alzheimer's, it's, oh, you know, I can do something. I can, uh, you know, help them with memory things or be a caregiver to them. When someone's having a seizure, besides moving stuff out of the way and turning them on their side, you're helpless. You know, timing. Is, is, and, and so for me, I think that's a big part for people is the, the seeing something so violent that's not part of everyday life and then that feeling of helplessness that makes people see epilepsy different than other brain conditions. Just real quick, um, you're talking about like Alzheimer's method and the population that's most likely to um, have several diseases <coughs> with children and adults. Children is the older adults. So my dad has dementia, but he's never had any seizures. So does that increase his chances of potentially having seizures as he gets older? It could because, I mean, the, the brain is changing. Uh, so I think that is a possibility. I don't think everyone who uh, develops dementia has seizures, but I, I believe it can increase the likelihood because of the, the brain changing. Yeah. Okay. There is no link, though. Yes. Um, from yes. dementia, like, like there's a link with autism. Okay. There's not a link with dementia or autism. Okay. But that would be, yeah. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. That's a good point. Uh, Another thing in this regard, in terms of the shame and the guilt, uh, for a lot of people, including myself, is I'm a burden. You know, people now have to uh, <laughs> adjust their entire life because of me. We had a lady in Uplift. And uh, I was going to go through and share some of the stories I went through last night, looking at all my notes from the different sessions and pulled a few things out. But uh, one of the ladies, she talked about how she was diagnosed a couple years ago, and she's in her mid 50s. And her daughter has kids, and her daughter essentially had to drop everything and become her caregiver and just the, the depression she feels that uh, she now has to be taken care of and her daughter has all these other being priorities in life. Being know, a being burden. Alone. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's going to be very real. The, the confusion around it, this same lady, it came up one time uh, very, uh, we, we had to kind of stop and process it because she had been out walking her dog and she had a seizure and she just forgot where she was what was going on. She had to call her daughter, and uh, her daughter was like, well, where are you? I don't know. So they had to do the find my iPhone thing just to come find her. And so it's one of those, like, th this is what she's processing that week with us, is the uh, feeling of, you know, being a burden, but also, I can't even help my daughter tell her where I am, uh, type thing. So, so that's where the shame and the guilt comes in. There's, uh, I don't know what that was. Uh, <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> um, there's a lot of family issues that you're going to run into, uh, and, and they, they run the gamut. Some families are overly protective, and every single thing that uh, goes wrong in a person's life is related to their epilepsy, and even epilepsy clients can start taking this on. And uh, just uh, treating non-epileptic seizure book, I mean, I know it's talking about NES, but it has a good point in terms of, at times, you might need to challenge your client, because they could be using epilepsy as more of a crutch than it is because their family has taught them that. Their family has, you know, put bubble wrap around them for so long and, and now that's how they view themselves. And so it might be encouraging them to look beyond that and challenging them. Is, is this really true or not? But more often it's the other end of the spectrum where families are sitting there going, yeah, you don't really have this. You know, th this isn't really a thing. You're making this up. Uh, more than a few people in Uplift talked about that in terms of uh, they avoided family gatherings because uh, people would either look at them differently or lecture them on how they don't have epilepsy. Uh, personally, this was probably, I don't know, 10 years ago. So I was diagnosed in 96, so I mean 22, 23 years ago. And probably 10 years ago, I was talking to my mom, and she was like, yeah, I don't 
don't know if you actually had that at the last one. <laughs> and it was one of those, and like she's very educated. She's you know gone through a ton of stuff with this, and I had to stop her and say, "You were with me <laughs> at my first neurologist appointment where I had an EEG, and they diagnosed me right then, and that was because the EEG showed brain activity, and that." how you diagnose between NEF and epilepsy. Like, I had to walk her through that. She was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. <laughs> and I, I think for her, I mean, we didn't talk about why, but I think for her, because I lived in Denver, there in Dallas, she hasn't been with me for a while, she talks to all these other people, and all these other people are like, well, you know, come on, is it really epilepsy, all this? So there's this general lack of knowledge that she begins listening to because she doesn't talk to me that often about my epilepsy. And so that's real. That's very real of a family member. Uh, and it, it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> and then they're going, no, I'm not making this up. I'm not saying, you know, uh, I, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish I didn't have to manage my medication as closely as I do or think about how I need to structure my day because of the stress level. Uh, so that's going to be another real piece to acknowledge or pay attention to. And just to pull out a few ideas or themes that we saw through Uplift, um, people who are new, and, and Uplift actually is, is great because some people have been diagnosed 20 years, some people had been diagnosed a couple months ago, uh, and, and these people diagnosed a couple months ago, they're all adults, and so they are rearranging their entire lives, and these are professionals. One lady was an attorney, and now she couldn't do anything that she had you know, gone to school for so many years to do. Uh, so, so people are going to be in different places, but some of the themes are the same. This was the very first Uplift session I did back in uh, 2015, they said, it, it feels like my world has been turned upside down. It feels like I'm not in control at, at any time. One lady who has been diagnosed for 30 years, she said, uh, to this day, I'm still called names like reported, like often. She said, I have a friend who recently committed suicide because they were sick of the ridicule. Uh, so, I mean, these things are real. Uh, one lady said, all I can do is cry because they just won't stop. There's nothing anyone can do for me, no doctors, nothing. So all I do is sit home and cry. That's their life. Uh, just to kind of pull out a couple more here because I thought they were impactful. I, I was telling Marcy and Heather, one lady, I went back and looked at these notes. She essentially that week said, the mistake I made was assuming other people had altruistic and helpful intentions. And that burned me, so now I know to never assume people are going to be helpful. And, and that's now her view of the world. Uh, and, so, and so these are things that will be coming through your door with this. Uh, another one, I'm dumb, I'm an idiot, I'm broken, uh, I'm worthless, I'm less than because of uh, you know my condition. One lady, uh, and we'll talk about here in a second, I wanted to just say this one because it was a good way of um, – using some of the skills she learned in Uplift. There's something that Uplift teaches called ARM, and it's essentially awareness, reality check, and modify that thought. But she had a seizure at her husband's workplace. She was refilling the Keurig machine, woke up from the seizure, and of course everyone's kind of standing around looking and everything. And her immediate thought was, everyone's judging me, everyone thinks, you know, uh, I'm, I'm some freak now type thing. And, and she said that in that moment, or, you know, after she kind of got some clarity, she was able to stop and uh, do some reality checking and look around and see that people actually had concern on their face, not so much, you know, fear and what's going on here. And so she was able to modify her thoughts. And, and that's the point of Uplift is teaching them these in-the-moment skills. And it's great to hear her say that because for so long she was someone who was very negative within the group. So being able to give them skills right then in the moment is uh, vital and I'm not, we, we always say that Uplift is not going to promise to reduce free, uh, seizure activity or seizure frequency, but a lot of people will report that. At the end of the eight weeks, nothing's changed from a medication perspective or anything else in my life, but I am seeing a reduction in seizures. And uh, these are people with epilepsy, so I know there are different ways to treat NES and epilepsy, but there's so much overlap because back in 96, uh, <coughs> My three rules given to me, reduce the stress in your life as much as possible, get eight hours of sleep every night, and reduce your alcohol intake. And that's, a, a, of course, on top of the golden rule of take your medication 
as required. But back then, uh, I, I got epilepsy due to concussions in high school football. And every neurologist I met with in the Dallas area gave me these rules and then said, totally up to you if you want to keep playing football. So that's how little we knew about head traumas back then, but how much we knew about stress and related to epilepsy. And so even though uh, NES really focuses on that piece, it's important for people with epilepsy as well to learn those stress management skills in the moment and then what they can do uh, outside of that to just keep it at a lower level because uh, the last point I'll say is I woke up one day in a gas station, in a gas station storage room with three strange men looking at me. That's my introduction to epilepsy. A few days later is when I was at the neurologist's office and did the sleep deprived EEG and had my second one. And from there, I, I remember the neurologist actually very clearly, he was explaining everything to me and I was like, yeah, I'm about to start my senior year in high school. Those aren't really uh, fitting with the plans I had. And I remember him very clearly just looking at me and saying, change your plans. Uh, <laughs> and so from then on, life was different and every single moment was, am I about to wake up after having a seizure? Am I about to, you know, wake up with all these people around me, maybe bleeding, maybe, you know, losing my bowel movements or uh, control? And so it is this high level of stress that is just constant. Uh, and then, of course, on the flip side is, oh, reduce your stress as much as possible. But, you know, deal with this new thing that uh, every single minute of your day, at least I was wondering, uh, am I going to harm someone? Am I going to harm myself? And in Texas, you couldn't drive for six months, but even when I got my license back, uh, every time I was behind the wheel, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm a senior in high school, I'm a stupid 17 year old, so I'm still going to drive, but it wasn't one of those. What's going to happen? So, so that is going to be something you will constantly work with people on is how do you live your life with that high level of stress that you can teach as many techniques as you want, but as an individual, that's always going to be there for someone with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we talked about the comorbidities earlier and how prevalent depression and anxiety are. Uh, sleep disorders are usually uh, the most common connected with comorbidities. So I'm going to move on here because we just have about 10 minutes or so. We put some goals in here of the uh, class or of uh, when you meet with people. These aren't things that you're sitting there with a checklist saying, okay, we did this, we did this. These are just good things to think about that research has shown to be helpful with people with epilepsy, but Heather's not going to call you up and say, yeah, num number three here, you didn't foster acceptance <laughs> or anything like that. It's just, you're not? <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> uh, but, but this is an important one uh, for a couple of reasons, and Marcy mentioned it, that uh, epileptologists and neurologists probably aren't going to be reaching out to you. You're going to be needing to kind of coordinate that care at times. And even this uh, therapist guide talks about spending one session coordinating a call. You, know, you coordinate beforehand, but you spend that session on the phone with the epileptologist and the nurse and working with them and everything to get everyone on the same page. But the other reason is because they might just decide to fall off. Hey, you know, I'm sick of this. I have my meds. They're, you know, working pretty well. I, I just don't want anything to do with the medical community. And that's where you're sitting there gently saying, I know it sucks. I know they can't give you good answers, and we need to stay connected to them. Uh, hopefully we all kind of know this about CBD, core beliefs. I'm worthless. I'm broken because I have epilepsy. It means everything I do, I'm going to ruin. Um, and to say truth, I'm kind of speaking from experience here, or uh, thought from growing up after being diagnosed. I'm going to ruin everything, so this party that someone's hosting, I'm, I'm just going to be a bar burden, so I'm going to stay home. You know, that, that's common. I'm going to socially isolate myself because I'm broken and I'm going to ruin something. That's going to be part of what you address. Uh, for me, I had to learn all, a lot of this on my own, which is what drove me to counseling, because I had to truly stop and tell myself worrying about this constantly is not what's going to help me. It's going to probably induce the seizure more than anything. So why am I feeling this right now? What triggered me to start thinking this way? Uh, and, and that's why it's so important is because it's educative. It's helping people go down that rabbit hole of what just happened that 
made you start thinking this way that now is going to increase the likelihood that you could have a seizure. So that guided discovery, those questions of what, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen here? What evidence do you have to show that or to you know, uh, support it or not support it? Are there other ways you could be thinking about this? Because you know, going back to that, I'm worthless. Well, being diagnosed with epilepsy, that's a pretty big jump to I'm worthless. So being able to challenge that is, no, I'm not. I just have to live a different life than other people do. You know, it, it's that type of stuff that you'll be working with people to come to accept. And then that internal locus of control, I think it's so important because people with epilepsy feel so out of control at times. Being able to help them recenter and focus on there are parts to this that you can control. And uh, in any situation, you can at least control your, your view of it and how you choose to respond to it, even if that's the only thing you can control. That's something for them to take and, and feel empowered. To just jump through here, like we talked about, thought stopping and challenging the ARM approach, becoming aware of a thought that could be negative or uh, unhelpful. How do you reality check it? How would you modify it? Some mindfulness practices. Uh, happy to share these. In the Uplift uh, guide, there are a couple really good ones that people have always responded to. The walking meditation one, people really like that. Uh, we, we would get a mixture. Some people would say, mindfulness really isn't for me. I don't get it. And then they would get to the session about the walking meditation, and they're like, oh, okay, now that I'm able to associate something with it of the, you know, thinking of the heel to toe and what it feels like to see outside all that, they start getting it more. So the walking meditation is a good one. There's a three-minute breathing space uh, within Uplift that we can share, but uh, a few participants always talked about how right then in the moment, that was a good one to use as they felt their stress level coming on or possibly indicators that they might have a seizure. They, they talked about, I stopped and I did that three minute breathing technique and that was very helpful. So we can provide that as well. But this is that point about teaching them cognitive behavioral techniques so they can begin exploring themselves. But when something's going on and they feel like they might have a seizure, then these mindfulness techniques are helpful to help reduce the possibility of something else. Uh, we talked about this earlier, the common treatment approaches to NES, the two that I'll point out <laughs> psychodynamics, you know, looking at any repressed negative emotions that could be impacting them today. And then the prolonged expo exposure, you know, it, this is just helping them possibly address uh, demons, for lack of a better term, but doing it in a safe way so you're not uh, doing anything that can create a seizure or create high levels of anxiety, but maybe finding a way to just expose them to something a little bit and show it's not as scary or they can maybe rethink their uh, viewpoint on something. SUDEP, uh, Marcy had hit on that. It's unfortunately real. Uh, we, we have a, a friend whose daughter passed away from it who was four. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's Maybe you're working with a family who's experienced someone uh, who passed away because of food apps. You know, that's something to think about as well because this isn't just for an epilepsy client. This is for an entire family. So that could be part of it. And the good news is that um, the patients may have never heard of food apps. This is very true. A lot of doctors do not share this with their clients that this is a possibility. Um, so if you happen to see them and they have suddenly learned about it, or you guys mentioned it in the health one. Um, just be prepared for the mental health part of that, <laughs> of you know, managing the anxiety that might come because now you just learned your child could die. You know, um, we've had doctors actually in recent years say um, the mom specifically asked, "Is is this a life or death sort of thing?" And the doctor said. No, the only thing you have to worry about is getting behind the wheel, you know, when you're not supposed to and having a seizure. She was like a 20-something-year-old. And a month later, guess what happened? Um, so the mom was just livid. I mean, she probably had a had a legal case. Yeah. So um, just be aware that some doctors aren't comfortable talking about it. Do you know the statistics on um, people who die? There is a statistic, and I 
Off the top of my head, it's something like um, it's actually I think one in one thousand of people who have uncontrolled seizures. Um, so what that means in the general population, there's also a number, but I can't remember that number. But I think it is important to remember the one in one thousand. It's not that uncommon if you have uncontrolled seizures. You know, when you say uncontrolled, does that mean that what medicine doesn't work at all, or or only works to a certain extent? Yeah, it's, which is the case in a lot of circumstance, circumstances that medication sort of works, but there's yes. like these breakthrough seizures. Um, so it's any anyone. I mean, because it could so have. Unless the medication is controlling it 100%, you, you're at risk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm very well controlled, but it can still happen at any time. I talk to my epileptologist a lot about how. Um, my eyes will flutter, and, and it happens a couple times a week, and they're just like, no, your medication is working, that's mm -hmm. the seizure being stopped. But mm -hmm. there could be a time where the seizure doesn't, or the medication doesn't work. <laughs> um, but, that's what it is. Yeah. 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 Um, seizures in the office, uh, I feel like we talked about this uh, to a good extent, but I know Seeing one for the first time could be scary, so happy to answer any additional questions. But biggest thing, time it. Uh, make sure they're safe. Uh, it's it's not always, not always a situation where you need to call in. And I was my current job. I remember my boss, who, who's a great boss, but he's like, hey, if a seizure were to occur, do I just call 911 and you know that's all you need from me? And it's like, no, actually I don't need that at all. <laughs> that's what I need. And, and again, he just didn't know. Uh, but it, it's not always an emergency. It's just part of their daily life. I mean, uh, a lot of people in Uplift have, one lady had 70 a month, and you can't call you know, 911 every time something like that happens. So. But I don't know if it, it probably maybe just depends on each person. Do people prefer if you just rub their back or kind of stroke their arm or I don't know, something like that? That's or, fine. Um, I I I'm I do know that we were at we are at eleven. I just have a few things to 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 talk about with the talk about the logistics of of um, of the network. So 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 if so if you could just give me a few more minutes, that'd be fantastic. Um, so what? So you you have a packet of pa pa paperwork. I mean, you've got a huge packet of paperwork, but it's all the stuff. Um, there is a letter to providers, um, a checklist. A grievance procedure and a couple things in the back of your packet. Is everybody seeing that? Mm -hmm. That right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I borrow this? It's, it's the, it looks like this. It, 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 it starts with this letter. Um, so this, the, this, 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 this letter here goes at, um, goes over the basics of, of, uh, of the program for, um, program for providers. Um, we have a provider agreement that is not yet finalized, hopefully next week. Um, I, I, I think I've mentioned to some of you, but the, the, this pro, pro, pro program is brand new. It's four months old at this point. Um, there isn't really a standard for it either, so we've just been fa fa figuring, out what, figuring out what works. Um, if, if, if there's any ever, um, if there's ever any feed, feed, feedback that you have of that you have a, um, about the program or about our, our, our um, about our communication. I'm so open to that because I'm really making this up as I go. Um, and I think so far it's looking pretty good and we'll see what happens. Um, so we, um, like, like I said about the, about the pro provider agreement, um, that will hopefully be coming to you with, 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 within the next few weeks. And we, we, we do, we do need that signed in return, but be, be, before we can start send, sending clients to you, um, and it's it's a pretty big do document. The only, only thing you have to send 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 back is is the last signature page. Um, if you have any qu questions about that, please send me an email or give me a call. Um, we have a pre and a post test for our clients. I have some copies of that here in the middle of the table. If you're interested in looking at that. Um, it's the quality, the quality, right? Okay. Sure. Sure. <laughs> that's, that's, on, 
that's how I'm going, going to pronounce it anyway. So it's it's a qual qual oh yeah yeah um, yeah it's it's a qual qual quality of life in 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 epilepsy surgery. And we 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 are asking you to come come to to do the pre test at the beginning of the first session and the post test obviously at at the last of the eight. Um, the other thing you have in your packet is a six month clinician check in sheet. And um, that 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 helps us track the the amount of se sessions that 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 you've had with our clients and the 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 amount of client feed. That 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 does need to be sent back uh, sent back a month at, at, at after you receive it. And we 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 do need to have this in hand in order for you stay in order for you to stay at, at, active in our network. Um, so we, we, um, I know I've talked to all of you at different points in our process. Uh, Matt, I think I talked to you really only, the, um, at, after the first few weeks that, that it, it had been started. So what, 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 what we've land, 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 what we've landed on is we are not asking, um, asking clinicians to do any billing. So that hopefully is a big relief for you guys because that looked kind of complicated to me. Um, we, 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 we are interacting only with, 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 with the clients for pay, payment pur purposes. We, 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 we will reimburse them for, a, for half of their payment, up to $30 for the first eight sessions. Um, and then cli cli clients need to send us a receipt with, um, with the name of the clinician they've seen, the date, date of the session, and how, how, much they, how much they paid. Just you saying, oh, I saw this client five times, isn't going, going going to be enough for us to re, re, reimburse the client. It's all on the client. So if um, if a client calls and says, "Hey, sir, thirty bucks, sir, how 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 um, how how however much is it, is a lot for me 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 to pay at all?" Um, they they can talk 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 they can talk to me. Um, I'll 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 be seeing just a few clients here, and then of course, as Mar Marcy mentioned, we have fine fine. Financial assistance is um, available as well. Um, I have had clients call, calling me already, and I have a wait list of about four to five um, folks who are in di different areas who can afford to different things. There, there's actually a mom whose just son died of sued sued death just a couple months ago. So um, I think that we we are really going going to see the ga gamut of clients, which, which is actually really exciting that we we. We can offer a variety of folks affected by 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 epilepsy these services. Um, so at, um, after the eight session, you've sent back the um, post post <coughs> post post Our 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 agency's involvement with you and the client is now over. So if um, if the client says, "Hey, you know, I'm hey, I'm done," you you can term 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 terminate. And we leave it up to you and the client if you you'd like to enter into a new agreement. But at that point, we're 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 stem, stepping out of the relationship. If you have other questions or want want to talk about uh, options for clients after that eight um, eight eight se 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 session mark is gone, just call me and we can see 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 if there's anything we can work out. Um, so we 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 ask you to, to to keep us entirely up to date on your office information, um, any issues that, that that happen with with your license, which we're just assuming is not going to happen. But but if it does, please let let us know immediately. Um, I'll, I'll also, if you wish, wish to leave the network, please let let we'll let us know too. Say you're seeing like four or five of our clients, and you're like, you know what, I'm done in the network. Those 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 don't. Those clients then can 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 either stay stay with you, but they'll 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 be paying your fee for price, um, or or if they want to get get a, get another referral, they they can call call me. Um, so in your packet, I have a welcome letter. I have a checklist of things um, that can can help 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 remind you of of the things you need to do. I have a copy of the six month six month check in form. Um, other thing, oh. So we have a logo that I, I I'm, I'm going to send to all of you, and this can go on your website, on, on your Facebook, um, any, any place you that you would like to display it. 
um, which is really exciting, I think super cool and a great thing to offer. Um, so in, in your packet, you, 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 you also have the client agreement. And this is a mostly finished draft of what, of, of what client, clients are signing and, and agreeing to be before you match them with, with the provider. So if you've got a client saying, oh, well, I didn't know about this thing, say, hey, it's in your client agreement, which, which, which you signed already. So I just wanted to give you a heads up about what's in there. Um, so again, like, like, like I said, we, 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 we're asking them to, to provide, their, provide their receipts to us. Um, and all, all of them must be submitted with, 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 within a month of, of, within, within a month of the, your last set session with, with, with them. And then, of course, you come completing the completing the right of service. Um, that's all we have today. Um, if it, if you have any questions now, you can feel uh, I have certificates for you, so I'm going to make sure you don't leave without those. Um, it, if if you have any questions about the network, um, it, any questions about the pro programs or resources that we offer, you can call me. You can call Marcy. Um, I, I think we we. We can both leave some stacks of cards out, mm -hmm. um, but I just want to say that this is brand 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 new for us and potentially across the nation. This, this is really exciting, and we so appreciate your 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 time and your 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 commitment to these clients. You've seen 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 the slides and heard Mar Mark and Mar Marcy talk, and that th this is a really pain 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 painful experience, not only for folks with epilepsy, but their friends and family and their community. So we're so grateful to have you. Thanks so much, and I'll get those certificates for you. Oh, and if you could do the evaluation form that I put next to you before you leave. Thank you. And we have to Mark, do you want to say that? Yes, code? sorry. Uh, for people listening to this webinar, uh, please contact Heather afterwards to let her know that you've finished completing it, and you need to tell her this to confirm that you listened to the whole thing. One in 26 will be diagnosed with epilepsy in their lifetime. So contact Heather, let her know that stat, and we will confirm you've listened to the webinar. Um, so it's kind of like the techniques that you recommend are evidence-based. But for example, I use um, brain spotting. While uh, there's evidence, it's not sort of reached the evidence-based mark. Would or, or uh, suggest that that not be used? Or how, what's your stance on that as far as? That's a good question. Um, I guess my, my first thought is just speaking with the client and being honest with them about uh, there, there is some research out there. There's not uh, a lot in this regard. Here's why I think it could be beneficial. Uh, and then seeing what they think, but also gauging it if you feel like things aren't progressing in treatment, right. maybe you know, switching gears as you would with any client. Right. So it, for me, it's not a knee jerk, no, you can't do that. This is the only way to treat them. But uh, it's probably worth it just talking to them up front about uh, this is something I believe in. I think it can help you. However, uh, from an evidence-based perspective, I, I can't point you to anything at this moment. Right. They're sort of working toward that process. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's my thought. I mean, Marcy, mm -hmm. Heather, anyone else? Yeah. I guess I'm yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yes. Let me Thank grab you that. <laughs> Very helpful. Oh, oh and one more thing. We're going to um, offer supplemental training. Um, 